Welcome to another Dr. Sadler's Honest Reviews. This is a series in which I review mostly recent works in philosophy, very broadly speaking, practical philosophy, self-help, leadership, all sorts of other things as well. And the book that I have today is by a friend and colleague, Massimo Pigliucci. It is A Field Guide to a Happy Life, 53 Brief Lessons for a living. And it's a little, you know, almost pocket book. Um, it's 150 pages, but they are some pretty, you know, short pages. So this is something that you could easily read your way through in less than an afternoon. Um, it's come out fairly recently from Basic Books. So 2020, first edition. Perhaps we'll see some more editions of this coming out in the future. And as usual, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the style and structure and summary, some of the key points of the works, what I think is good about the book, what I think is problematic about the book, and then I'll wrap up from there. So I think this is kind of an interesting book to look at in terms of its structure first, because it really does have an unusual way in which it is set up. There's uh, several different parts, the bulk of which is the actual field guide part two, which is divided into six sections. And then that is bookended by part one titled Betting on the Philosopher's Slave. The Philosopher's Slave obviously is Epictetus. And there's a couple different kinds of things in there as well. And then we have part three, Stoicism 2.0. And then there's two appendices to it and some acknowledgments and, and some notes in the end of it. So there's, there's a lot of different things packed into this, but you could say that the, the central structure of it is Massimo Pigliucci taking Epictetus's Enchiridion, which is one of the most famous works of Stoic philosophy. It's one of the things that in intro to philosophy classes or ethics, we often throw at students as a representative of Stoicism. It has had a long and storied history uh, throughout the ages as well. And it's, you know, it's fairly short and kind of uh, pithy and packed and, and punchy, you could say. And what Massimo is doing in most of this book, well, at least in a good part of this book, is taking Epictetus's Enchiridion and updating it for a late modern age in which we might not buy into all of the things that Epictetus is advocating or that Arian represents Epictetus as advocating since Arian wrote down these uh, discourses and also the um, uh, Enchiridion is sort of a best hits list. Um, and, and Massimo is, is doing this quite deliberately and thoughtfully and consciously and explaining what he's doing along the way. Um, if we if we begin at the beginning, right, with this, after we get past the praise for it, betting on the philosopher slave, part one, we have uh, a little bit of a, you know, story of um, Epictetus and, and why uh, Massimo himself got interested in him. A lot of it is, is actually talking more about Epictetus um, and, his, and then Massimo's uh, discovery and how he incorporated it into his own practice and life. And you know, if you don't know who Massimo is, a little bit of background, he is one of the big you know, representatives of modern Stoicism. He belongs to the same organization, Modern Stoicism Limited, and he does a lot of blogging and podcasting and events and things like that, connect, and writing books connected with, with Stoicism. He also had a long career prior to that as well, both in biology and in, in philosophy. So he talks a bit about Epictetus, and then we have the how to use this book. He says that this is a book to carry around with you. The first section is meant as a general introduction to Stoicism and Epictetus. Use it as a quick for refresher. Um, the field guide is the second section, and then... Um, the third and last section of the guide is a handy, handy summary of how modern Stoicism, at least in my version, diverges from the original 
keeping in mind that Stoicism has constantly been altered and, uh, and updated. Then he's got a, a you know sort of thing on it's called Stoicism 101, and it you know it, it's going over some really really basic stuff. Uh, it's very short, and then finally he gets to Epictetian philosophy 101. So this is a subdivision, you could say, of Stoic philosophy, and in many respects a reinterpretation of it, and he gives you some uh, guidance about what's, what's going on there, and we'll come back to that in a bit. Then we have the, the field guide, and the field guide is divided into really five main sections that have to do with the Enchiridion. They're, each of them has titles and you know they're supposed to be um, bringing certain sections of the Enchiridion, which is by the way not organized in a thematic fashion, although people do like Massimo is here, read in uh, themes to it as, as being parts of sections. So here's, here's the, the sections. Setting things straight where you learn the most important and practical lesson of them all. That's the first one. Second one, training your desires and aversions where you begin to reorient your likely misguided desires and aversions. Third, training to act in the world where you prepare yourself to behave justly towards other people. Fourth, training yourself to think better, where you prepare yourself to improve your judgments about things and people. Fifth, training to live well, where you prepare yourself to practice the art of living. And then there's finally a sixth section, which is just four very short passages um, from Epictetus, four pieces of advice from Epictetus where we listen to the master. And like I said, that's the bulk of this work. And, you know, as you can see, very short that you can, you know, check out, read, mull over, meditate on. Um, I should actually mention at this point, before we finish the, the uh, structure part, that the style is, you know, typical Massimo, very clear, uh, except for at a, a few points that I'm going to mention, when, the problematic thing. Um, modern language, easy to read, easy to grasp. I, I think, you know, that's actually a high point of Massimo's books. Um, so, you know, here, here's an example from section 37. We all play several roles in life, but suppose you've decided to play a role that's not appropriate to you or beyond your abilities. If you were an actor, you would have ruined the play for the spectators, the other actors, and yourself. So consider carefully what projects you engage in and whether you're suitable for them. And by the same token, be sure not to neglect some other projects for which you are, in fact, well suited. Now, if you've read Epictetus's Enchiridion, that will sound familiar to you, but if things are being moved around and, and you know, spoken of in a different way. And that's, that's really the style of what's going on in this section. And then finally, we get to the um, last part where um, Stoicism 2.0, one section is called Updating Stoicism, and it goes through a number of different themes where Massimo says that, listen, you know, Stoicism needs to be rethought in this way or this way. And then we have uh, the second section, this is not the first time and it won't be the last, which is essentially a discussion about how the, the Enchiridion and Stoic philosophy has been updated and, and whether, whether that's okay to do or not. And then we have these appendices. Now, Appendix 1 is very useful, a conceptual map of the differences between the Enchiridion and the field guide. So you can see here, it's a sort of, you know, side-by-side -side comparison of what's going on in the original Enchiridion and what's going on in Massimo's updated field guide. Very helpful, I think. Um, then there's also a um, annotated bibliography. Not bad, you know, rather short. Um, and, you know, it, it, it sort of represents a good picture of the people Massimo himself is, is particularly engaged with. So that gives you a good idea about what's going on in terms of the structure of the work and also a little bit about the style. When we're thinking about the main ideas of this work, uh, because of the very nature of this as an updated Enchiridion with some, as I mentioned, bookended materials before and after, 
a lot of the main ideas are those of Epictetus's interpretation of Stoicism. So, for example, the dichotomy of control is an important one. The distinction between what's in our power, what's not in our power, or you know, not in our control, or not our business, not up to us. Um, that's you know a central Stoic idea. There's other ideas about role ethics and following our roles and discerning what they are. There's a lot of practices built in about how to deal with what the Stoics called appearances or impressions, phantasiae in the Greek. Um, you know ways in which we can rethink and reapply ourselves when we get to determinate situations. How to prioritize properly how not to allow things to get to us or get us down when they don't have to, how to tell if we're making progress, all, all sorts of things like that are in the Enchiridion. And so necessarily they're going to be here in Massimo's um, reinterpretation. I will mention another thing, you know, this is something that shows up very early on, and this shows up pretty consistently in Massimo's work, and he's not, he's not unique in this. Um, Pierre Addo does this as well. Um, there's a big emphasis on what are called the three disciplines. This is coming from a passage in Epictetus where he, he goes over what these disciplines are. We don't actually know whether this was, you know, um, Epictetus putting his own spin on things or an orthodox Stoic position. Seneca actually talks about three different disciplines. Epictetus will talk about three other disciplines later on in, in one of the passages in, in this. So it's a little bit uh, tricky, but Massimo is using that as a sort of organizing structure. So we have the discipline of desire and, and aversion, the discipline of action, also sometimes called the discipline of choice, right? and then the discipline of ascent. And so those provide a kind of framework structure. Um, the whole idea of updating Stoicism, that is a big thing, not just you know found in the last section, but running throughout the entire work, because that is Massimo's project, Stoicism 2.0. And he tells you what he Thinks that means. And I think it would be good for us to go and look at those themes. So we're kind of starting at the end. Um, he, he tells us that we should go back to the classic distinctions the Stoics themselves made between logic, physics, and ethics. He talks about you know what they meant by that a bit. He proposes that the Stoic philosophical recipe boils down to logic plus physics equals ethics. And then we get to these, these themes. So theme one, externals don't need to be despised. And this is an important departure from some of the stuff that Epictetus is saying. And you'll actually find in um, the, the field book places where Massimo is saying, yeah, externals are externals, right? They, they don't have value in and of themselves, but we don't have to despise them. Um, that's a little bit over the top. Theme two, there's no need to cultivate indifference to human loss. This is a big sticking point for many people reading Epictetus and thinking about Stoicism. How should we understand loss, grief, uh, matters like that? Theme number three, live according to nature, which basically here Massimo brings up the passage from Diogenes Laertes where you know we get two different kinds there's the the nature of the universe that we have to adapt ourselves to so you know not kicking against fate or not believing physical things to work in ways they don't work and then a distinctively human nature which is rational and social um, and that's again f very common in, in Massimo's work to, to interpret it that way um, theme four is very interesting, questionable science or metaphysics. Massimo is, is making the case that, listen, we no more than we need to buy into like Aristotelian metaphysics, do we, or physics rather, do we have to buy into stoic physics about the way the world works? We can update it with, you know, better understandings um, coming from physics or biology. Um, theme five, God or atoms, and he says, this is perhaps the most radical change I'm proposing uh, you know, we, we can say that it, it, we don't really need to have a providential ordering. It's, it's kind of, he says, I find the Stoic notion of providence beautiful and comforting, 
But as a scientist living in the 21st century, I can't accept it. We have no reason to believe that the sentience is a property of the cosmos, uh, or that there is any such thing as the pneuma or similar all permeating substance, or that the universe is anyway like a living organism. So we can, you know, kind of put that off. And this is quite a long section uh, here. Theme six, this, I think this is very important too. Local customs are neither universal nor immutable. And, you know, he uses the example of Epictetus. Um, not really having much to say about slavery other than that, you know, real slavery is being a slave to your desires or those who control the things that your desires are aimed after. Um, and just leaving those sort of cultural assumptions about slavery there. We could think also about Epictetus and his insistence that a man ought to have a beard or else he's being effeminate. We could say, well, that's, that's a matter of that culture. and we, we don't have to buy into that. And, and we can talk about cultural progress. And then theme seven is social justice. Um, and this is, this is quite important. You know, the Stoics really, really did stress justice and no interpretation of Stoicism is a real interpretation if it puts justice aside. And, you know, Stoic justice would include much of what we these days call social justice. Um, so, you know, for example, he says, there's no reason whatsoever within Stoicism to discriminate on the basis of sex, gender, ethnicity, or any other arbitrary or biological categorization of human beings. On the contrary, the fundamental notion of a Stoic notion of cosmopolitanism entails any such discrimination ought to be rejected as incompatible with Stoic philosophy. That, that's dead on. He's actually quite correct, both about ancient Stoicism and about how we ought to understand it in, in the present. Um, so those are some, you know, really important main ideas, I would say. Uh, that gives you a good sense about what's going on in this book. Um, I will say this, too. Because of the organization of the book, you're getting a lot of the key ideas in exactly this form, in little nuggets that you can read, think about, assimilate, and then, you know, try to apply, see if you succeed, and then come back to, so this would become like a, a genuine field book that you would use over and over again. I think that gives you a good idea about what the key ideas, plural, are in this little field book. All right, let's talk about some of the good points of this work. I, I want to say right off the bat that the idea of taking Epictetus's Enchiridion and not just rewording it for a modern audience, but sort of critically assessing what needs to be updated and what can stay the way it is, it's actually a pretty brilliant idea. I kind of I kind of wish I'd done this, you know? Um, there's what, you know, the ancients called emulation, zealous, right? Um, feeling, feeling that. Now, you know, some of these um, are, are really great paraphrases. Some of them, you know, are, are uh, decent. And uh, there's none where I'm like, oh, that's really off. Um, so it, I think it's, it's a very competent and helpful in general um, in reinterpretation of the Enchiridion. Um, I think that it could be helpful for people who don't know that much about Stoicism, I think you could give this to them. And except for the things that I'm going to point out in the next section, you know, they're going to be getting a, a fairly decent sense about what Stoic philosophy is about and how we'd apply it in the, you know, modern age. And um, they could they could really make use of this. This is a good book in that, that sense. Um, you know, Massimo is somebody who's done his research. Um, he's uh, giving you a lot of great background material and arranging things in helpful ways. I do want to also point out that I really think that this um, conceptual map is great. You know, this is, this is also a feature that I really like because it lets you look at each of the little, um, chapters, the vignettes, right? And say, okay, here's what Epictetus was saying. 
Here's how Massimo is reinterpreting it. Here's the general theme. <clears throat> this is quite good. And uh, many of these are, well, the general themes are all tied in with these updating of Stoicism. So that's, that's quite a powerful analytic tool for somebody who wanted to use this. Um, I think that, you know, Massimo's reinterpretation of Stoicism, what he's representing here as Stoicism 2.0 is, you know, pretty much on point. There's some places where I think there could be additional amplification. Um, but this is, a, you know, this is a short book. It's not intended to do everything else that his other books available about Stoicism do. So I don't think that's, that's something to, to criticize him about. And, you know, I do think that um, this discussion about how to update Stoicism is, is really quite helpful. I think you could take that and use it in Stoic meeting groups to say, this isn't the only way that you can do modern Stoicism, but here's a very coherent way to do modern Stoicism. Um, and, and I think, you know, some people might disagree with it, but I think it could be actually very useful for that purpose. As a matter of fact, I will say too that I think this could be used as a book, not just to give an individual person and say, well, here, here, try out some stoicism, but it could be used for group meetings as well as a sort of textbook and discussion provoker. Um, so that is, you know, that's the good stuff about this book. I do have to admit there are a few things that I find problematic about this book, and they basically fall into um, three categories. One has to do with the price of the book for what you're getting. Um, another has to do with the fitting things into five neat sections when it comes to the Enchiridion material. And then the other is just sort of like little bits and pieces of things here where you're like, oh, that was not all that well expressed and could be misleading for a reader who doesn't actually know what, what's being referenced all that well, who doesn't have the background information. So for example, here early on in the book, on page five, um, we read the only two sets of teachings we have from Epictetus are Arian's notes collected in four books of discourses, in parentheses, half of which are unfortunately lost, and a short handbook or manual known as the Enchiridion. Now, reading that, that would give you the impression that there were four books of the discourses, half of which were lost. That's not right. We have four books of the discourses. There were originally supposed to be eight books, we have four because half of them were lost. And you know, that's something that could be confusing for some people. It, does a lot turn on it? No, it's not like, you know, totally getting stoicism wrong or anything like that. But it is, you know, uh, a point. I, I, I don't really like the characterization of temperance. I think it's partly right, but it leaves out some things. He, he characterizes temperance in the, you know, listing the virtues as the inclination to do things in right measure, neither too little nor too much. Yes, that's technically correct, but there's also a very, very strong identification in Stoicism with temperance as self-control, as the virtue that's needed in order to sort of resist the desires and aversions and, and passions. So something got left out that I, I don't think should have been left out. Now, uh, you know, Massimo is going to, to say that Epictetus is actually replacing the virtues with the three disciplines, which I, I don't really actually buy as such. And I think that's misleading as well. So maybe the virtues in a certain sense don't matter as much, um, but I, I, you know, I, I don't think that that um, three disciplines substituting for the virtues is right. Epictetus talks less about the virtues than other Stoics do, but he does talk about them in his discourses and um, even, you know, implicitly in the Enchiridion. Um, the other thing that I, I have, uh, I think is, is problematic and it's inconsistently problematic, is claiming 
that, uh, here we go. The third discipline, that of ascent, is meant to improve our faculty of judgment, what Epictetus refers to as proiresis. That's wrong. Um, crisis would be judgment. Um, and, or the rational faculty could be doing judgment. Proiresis is the faculty of choice, which, you know, in the, the later uh, actual uh, Enchiridion reinterpretation is translated here, like, for example, in, in chapter 9, as will. <laughs> Right, so that's that's misleading. Is it? You know, are, are any of these things that are misleading going to totally take a reader off track? No, I don't think they're really big things. These are maybe uh, I, I don't say that they're just quibbles because they are they are indeed problematic, but they're mildly problematic, and I think you can overlook those. I don't buy the neat fit of. Um, these five sections and all of these chapters fitting into those. Um, I will say that there's a long history of doing this that goes not just in the, the modern age, but all the way back to the ancient period. For example, Simplicius in his commentary on Epictetus's Enchiridion, he does something kind of similar. So actually Massimo is in good company in doing that. I just don't, I don't think it's that neat of a fit. Um, I understand why he's doing that. But, you know, again, I, I think I wouldn't have done it that way. But maybe that's not that big of a criticism because I didn't write this book and Massimo did. The last thing that I'm going to say about it is that, you know, looking at the back, this book is $20 U.S., 26 Canadian. I think that's, even though it's got a very nice cover design and it's, you know, well laid out, that's kind of pricey for a book this size, I think it, it probably should be cheaper. And I, I hope that it, it sells enough copies to come out in a paperback form that would be much less expensive because that's the one thing that would actually hold me back from using this. I, I wouldn't ask people to pay $20 for a book like this if I was you know, teaching uh, using this. I, I would probably, you know, try to find some work around, quite frankly. But those aren't really a lot of bad things to say. So maybe in some respect, uh, that's a sign of it being a pretty good book. All right, final thoughts. Um, on the whole, I give this a qualified recommend to get. Um, again, I'm not happy about the price, but I think it's, it's quite good. I think this is a book that if you do buy, it, it will work as a field guide. These are not brief lessons for living that you read once and then you're like, oh, throw the book away. <laughs> Although actually, you know what you could do is you could take this book and you use it for a couple weeks and then you pass it on to somebody else. That might be a really nice way of doing things, making use of, of this very solidly put together book. Um, it is something that you would use as a field guide or as a, you know, vada mecum, as, as uh, Massimo says in here, carry it around with you and go over it and over it. Um, so I, I think that it's uh, uh, quite a good book, and I do in, indeed recommend that those who are interested in Stoic philosophy, whether they're at the very beginner level or intermediate or even experts, I'd say everybody can get something out of this, not least because Massimo is providing some very competent reinterpretations of Enchiridion's classic lessons for us.